So uh, I'm uh, Professor Ross Walker from the uh, San Diego Supercomputer Center and also the University of California, San Diego. And I'm going to talk to you today about what we term uh, the Amber Molecular Dynamics Code. Uh, but before I start, I just want to highlight uh, some information about my research group. So we, part of what we do is software development. We do GPU and mic acceleration of uh, not just molecular dynamics codes, but other codes across the whole HPC space. Uh, that's how I got started at the Supercomputer Center. But we also apply that to looking at lipid simulations. We look at uh, various different ways proteins work within, within lipid membranes, how drugs uh, transport across a cell membrane, for example. And we develop the underlying mathematical models for this. Uh, we look at things like enzyme activation and ways in which we can develop novel drugs. Uh, we look at quantum mechanical, uh, molecular mechanical MD approaches, and then we look at automated refinement. Uh, we call ourselves the Walker Molecular Dynamics Lab, but it's mostly so we can register this URL here, uh, which it turns out actually no one had registered. I registered this on the day that George Bush left office. Uh, so this points to the lab. If you want any more information about the various people involved and what we do, the main thing I want to highlight, though, is while we do all of these different types of things, underlying all of that is the fundamental software that we develop uh, that's used widely across the country. Uh, and obviously, no one stands alone, so these are the people involved. The person I really want to highlight here is Perry Needham. Uh, she's the one leading the effort on uh, Xeon Phi optimization. So given that, let's start with, first of all, what is AMBER and what is the AMBER Molecular Dynamics Code? It, it stands for two things. It, it stands in one thing from, for a list of false cells. These are mathematical models for describing how proteins, nucleic acids, lipids, etc., interact in our body, interact with different molecules. These are all available, and these are used across multiple codes, and this is kind of a history of where this all began. But the main part of it is it's a suite of programs used for doing chemistry and computational molecular biology right, on computer. Right now, we're up to version 15, uh, and it's distributed in two parts. One that we call AMBER 14, uh, which we release on every second version cycle. And this is what I'm going to concentrate on today. This is the highly scalable uh, part of the, of the code that actually does the MD simulation. That is how different particles interact with each other over time. This is very computationally expensive. Separate from that, we have AMBER tools, which we release on a, on a one-yearly cycle. And this contains various setup, analysis techniques, uh, all of the data processing, etc. Uh, what's beginning to happen now, though, is while we've spent the last several years focusing on getting the, the computationally expensive part of this calculation working very well, what we've done is move a lot of the problems into the uh, data analysis space. So we're now working on better ways to do our data analysis. Uh, and then this is independent from a full, full seals. This code began in the 1970s, and there's still bits of the code in there that are original from the 1970s, I think. Uh, I've seen stuff, comments from 1983 and so on in there. Uh, right now, it's 850,000 lines of code and growing. Uh, the, the main part of the code here is about 60 to 80,000 lines. Uh, and it's written in a combination of everything from Fortran C, C++, Python, CUDA, Perl. It's developed by a large number of different grad students and postdocs. And what tends to happen is they chuck in whatever they like and prefer to program on, and we get a hodgepodge of everything. Uh, so if you want to test your environment and test a compiler, this is the way to do it. It will break just about every compiler. Uh, but we mainly focus on the main compute part of the code. We work very well to make it as clean as possible. And that really is a combination of Fortran and C right now. Uh, so what is molecular dynamics? Uh, it's not this. This is supposed to be moving <laughs> and actually showing you some dynamics. Uh, but essentially, it's a way of simulating how a chemical system evolves with time. right? And that's important uh, because it allows us to look at biological factors, what are termed enzymes. And that's what controls all of the reactions that go on in your body, from every drug metabolism to to the way sugars are metabolized to receptors in your brain. Every single part of your body relies on these biological systems. Right? And therefore, they're, they're classics for drug targets. Uh, there's a number of different programs in the field that do this. Amber, which I'm talking about here, there's Charm, Namdi, Lam, Scromax, etc. Uh, 
all of these in some way are right now are involving Intel and Intel Xeon Phi systems. Uh, so we're just part of all of this. Uh, but the main thing is what can we learn from molecular dynamics, right? And the key is it gives us time ordered information, right? And that means we can look at how a biological system evolves with time. We can do things like reaction rates, activation pathways. We can look at stability, right? We can adjust a, if we have a biological uh, system, we can adjust it to make it more temperature stable, for example, or more pH stable. We can look at protein folding, unfolding pro pathways. And then more importantly, we can do experiment on computer. Right? That is, we can study mutation effects. I can say, what happens if I mutate this uh, residue in a protein? What will that do? Right? Uh, we can look at environmental effects. I can look at how something will respond to temperature and pressure. This is particularly important in biocatalysis, for example. Uh, the National Renewable Energy Lab, they're looking at uh, cellular biohydrolase that converts essentially wood into sugars that you can ferment to bioethanol. The idea is, you know, can we change the temperature in which one of these enzymes wants to work from body temperature to something higher? Uh, and then we can study properties that cannot be measured experimentally. We can construct thermodynamic cycles to calculate drug binding, etc. Uh, traditionally, though, we've always needed supercomputers for this, and the question is why. And it really comes down to this. We have complex equations. Now, if I show this to a mathematician, it doesn't look too complex. I see some people in the audience frowning at this. This is, this is very simple, right? This is, a, this is just summations. These are just linear equations. You show this to a mathematician, they think this is simple. Right? The problem is, of course, that we have to do that over a huge number of atoms. So here's an example. This is cellular biohydrolase on a piece of cellulose in water. There's 800,000 atoms in here. right? And we have to essentially calculate the interaction of every single one of these atoms with every other atom in here. And then we replicate this in three dimensions infinitely through space. And we have various tricks for doing this. But the real problem comes that we need lots of time steps, right? So on a single step, we would calculate, for a single snapshot, we would calculate the interaction of all of the atoms in the system, right? Uh, the problem then becomes that gives us an energy and it gives us a gradient of that, which is the forces on all of those atoms. And then we need to propagate that system through time to understand how it's, how it's going to evolve. And the problem comes down that we're constrained by our fastest motion in our system, right? And that is the vibration of a, of a hydrogen atom, like a CH bond, for example. And that's on the order of two femtoseconds, right? That's what it limits, about 10 femtoseconds for the vibration. This limits us to a two femtosecond time step per step. Light travels six microns in two femtoseconds, right? That's a very, very short period of time. The problem is that biology span 16 orders of magnitude, right? This is a huge range. That's one with 16 zeros after it. 16 orders of magnitude of range, from bond vibration that takes place on the femtosecond scale, all the way up to slow protein folders that take place on the second scale, right? Most of what we want to look at takes place on the microsecond scale, right? Nanosecond to microsecond scale. And what this means is, to get to a microsecond, we need 500 million steps, right? So, we have to calculate the interaction of all of those atoms that gives us our forces. We calculate a new acceleration of those atoms. We calculate new positions. We repeat. And we repeat that 500 million times to get a microsecond. Uh, to put that in perspective, if I wanted to do this simulation in one day, right, that's 186 microseconds of wall clock time per step. Right? So if you give me an interconnect between nodes that's got a two microsecond latency, we're toast if we want to reach this number. right? So we have to do, and, we'll, and the real problem is everything, and maybe I didn't put it on this slide, but the problem is each sequential step requires us to solve a previous step, right? We don't have an analytical solution to Newton's equations of motion here, right? So we have to get the code to be as fast as possible, and this really is why we've been looking at accelerating things uh, and why we've been involved in looking at Xeon Phi, and that is that they bring a large amount of computing power to an individual node, right? And that's really this idea of you know, scaling to large machines for individual simulations is not easy. I can still build multi-million atom systems and run them for short amounts of time or run replicas of them and so on that I can run on large HPC machines. But in some ways, we're beginning to get constrained at high core counts by communication, right? And really, the interconnect is just not keeping up with the compute speed. And what the idea is, is that you know, really, 
by adding coprocessors to nodes, we reduce that latency down, and that allows us really to get better performance within an individual node, right? And the idea being we have individual researchers, graduate students, and so on, that want to be able to do reasonable amounts of simulation, may not always have access to supercomputers. So we've been looking at getting individual nodes working as best as possible, and then coupling that to scale up to the very large scale of systems, right? Uh, so, as I said, Intel Xeon Phi offers us uh, performance within a node, and we have, now we've supported, right now the Amber code is released, and I'll talk about it in just a minute, but it's working in offload and native mode right now. Those are the two we focused on. Uh, if you're interested in the technical details, I'm not going to have time to go through too much of it here. Uh, but we have a paper, it's in review right now, unfortunately, but we just got the reviews back and they're fairly favorable. So I think this paper will be out in the next month or so. Uh, if you're interested in a preprint of this or some of the background on, on, in confidence, please email me and let me know and I'll send you a copy to look at. And this hopefully will be out in computer physics communication shortly. And then we have a book chapter. It says chapter six here, but it's actually going to be chapter 19 of uh, Parallelism Pearls version, uh, volume two, uh, which I think is in press now and should be out within the next few months, right, Lisa? Yeah, so, so that goes through and describes the actual scientific back of the, the technical background behind this. Uh, so what's the workflow, what's involved? This, I'm gonna skip through this very quickly, but this basically shows you the flowchart of what's going on in the code. And that is we have the main code itself that does MD, it does initialization and setup, etc. And then it calls this force routine, which is going to calculate the force on all the atoms. And then this is going to loop around here, calculating forces, calculating velocities, updating positions, parallels, etc. The key being this loop is serial, unfortunately, right? Because we're integrating in time. Now we have various tricks we can do to do multiple runs together, but this is where most of the work is done. And most of it comes into this PME force part of a calculation. And if we go in there and take that, expand this further, it consists of things like we zero the energies, we update a pair list, which is what's interacting with what atoms. We might do this every seven to 10 steps or so. Then we calculate our non-bonded contributions, that is the van der Waals and electrostatic interactions between all the atoms. And this has, uh, and this is done in two parts. This is done uh, in a direct space somewhere, it's just a straight pairwise interaction, and it's done in a reciprocal space out to infinity, which makes use of Fourier transforms. So we have simple, multiplication divided by a distance over a large number of particles, plus a whole series of FFTs, convolutions, and so on. And then we have bonded contributions, which is the chemistry involved here, the actual bonds between atoms, the angles, and the dihedrals. This tends to be a very short number of, ca of iterations, so this is fairly quick. The nice thing, at least, is that within this loop here, we can do these more or less in any order, with the exception of the zeroing, right? So we can do the self-energy, the K-space, and the van der Waals correction. We can do those out of order and so on. Uh, and we can also split up the non-bond energy into atom counts. And then we also have a pair list, which I'm gonna skip for time. Uh, but this just gives you an idea. We take back previous equations and we expand them out and make them a little more complicated uh, with double summations over atoms. And then this is hiding an error function. And then this is hide, this reciprocal part is hiding a whole FFT. Uh, and then we have a bonding force, which I'm gonna skip. But the main part is how did we go about just taking this in the first version and putting it onto Xeon Phi? So we've had a long history now. Uh, I think it's probably on coming on 20 years now since we did uh, MPI, right? And we've been working since that in the parallel version of the code for every major HPC machine that comes out. So we have a well-defined, spatially decomposed version of our code. And that is, uh, what we're looking at is atoms have position in three dimensions. We can divide that up in a way that matches the layout of the actual cores in our, in our nodes and so on. And we do that right now with MPI. And then it was a case, how can we do this on Xeon Phi with the absolute minimum amount of uh, extra coding and, and, and causing us, yeah, in, in a way that you could take the Xeon Phi out and still be able to run the code, right? We didn't want to have to have multiple versions of the code and so on. And the simplest approach we took here was to take the direct space sum, not worry about the Fourier transforms for now, but take the direct space sum, uh, divide it up into a certain number of MPI tasks that would run on individual Xeon, Xeon cores, and then eat a certain number of these, depending on how many Xeon files you've got, one of these MPI threads 
within the central part of a box, which tends to be the densest part of a calculation, uh, we would offload that onto the MP onto the uh, Xeon Phi, and then we use an open MP parallelization on the Xeon Phi. Right. The nice thing is by doing this, we can tune those two. Right. So this you can have one task offload to a Xeon Phi. You could have four Xeon Phi's in a box, and have four different boxes offload, or we can do four, so we could do four or eight MPI tasks here, and each one of those spawns a subset of open MP threads on the Xeon Phi. And the idea being we could then tune those two for optimum performance, which, as is everything in supercomputing, is very much dependent on the problem you're trying to solve, right? So we're now working on auto tuners to do this. Uh, and then what we had to do as part of this, so the first version of that didn't do very well, and that's really because the density fluctuates quite a bit. And as we found out, uh, what will happen is, depending on the way we, the way we lay, lay these out and communication bottlenecks, especially when you go to multi-socket nodes and so on, uh, is we would get certain threads, especially the ones on the Xeon Phi, would complete before other threads did. And we couldn't give them enough work. So, and then what would happen is, over time, your density changes. If you've got a protein that folds up, for example, the number of interactions may, may not remain constant as a function of time. So we had to do a dynamic load balancing system, which every so many steps, we start offloading to the Xeon Phi, but then it keeps track of how long and how, how efficient that was. And then it can, it can adjust the size of these boxes that it gives to the Xeon Phi uh, in order to do that. And what's nice about this is we, this, if you put in different Xeon Phi's that have different performance, for example, it would automatically tune for that over time. And also, if there's, when you run this on multiple nodes, if there's a, a bottleneck on one of the nodes, for example, it'll slowly adjust to that. Uh, what does the performance look like? So this is the first version that we released. Uh, we have, I'm giving just examples here for cellulose, which is 408,000 atoms, and then satellite tobacco mosaic virus, which is just over a million atoms in solution. Uh, and this is running on... We did this initially on Sandy Bridge and Ivy Bridge. We have up, I'm trying to get updated numbers right now for Haswell, but we're, we're waiting for the hardware to arrive. Uh, but essentially, right now, we took our Sandy Bridge and our Ivy Bridge, and we did a lot of work which I haven't covered here, which was actually just optimization for Xeon, for Xeon itself, right? So we spent a lot of time re-optimizing the code for the Xeon chip, and then when we add the Xeon Phi right now, we go from, this is in nanoseconds a day, so we go from around 1.91 to about 2.5, right, for a single Xeon Phi. Now, that's not great, uh, but there's at least a factor of two that we're missing in here in terms of making use of precision, which I'll come to in a minute. Uh, and then we have separate code, uh, which works. This is, this is uh, just to show it works on multiple nodes right now. So this is, this is a performance in nanoseconds per day, for the cellulose benchmark on one node, two nodes, three and four nodes, with and without a Xeon Phi in each one of those nodes. Right? Uh, so we do get acceleration right now. Uh, what we're working on now, though, is changing the, the precision in which we do the calculations. So uh, historically, we've always used double precision for calculations, mainly because on a CPU, it didn't make that much difference whether you did double precision or single precision. It was just a factor of two. Uh, these days, though, with vector units and so on, uh, going to actually single precision can give you a benefit, not only because it, it improves the amount of floating point operations you can do, but at the same time, it reduces the size of the messages you're sending and how much you're... And when you offload to a Xeon Phi, for example, it reduces how much you have to upload and download, right, by a factor of two. Uh, now, you can't, tradi you can't just go to single precision, which is what we've what has been tried initially, right? If I, and this is just showing the difference in force between a single precision calculation and, and a full double precision. This is the difference between uh, running just on the Xeon and running on the Xeon Phi, right? And then this is, if we run entirely in single precision, this is in kcals per mole per angstrom, right? Uh, but basically, if we go to what I call SPFP here, this is a fixed precision version we're looking at, but we have a, what we call SPDP as well, which is a, double, a single double precision hybrid that does individual calculations in single precision, all the summations in double precision, etc. where we've gone through and do a full audit of code. We get about an order of magnitude improvement, uh, and 
just to show you what happens, so this is a constant energy simulation, right? These, these equations should conserve energy and angular momentum. If we run here, which is what happens if we run single, uh, double precision or the hybrid precision, we conserve energy. If we run single precision, the thing just slowly heats up over time, right? Uh, so we're looking at putting this into the code as we go on right now, which will get us better use of the vector units. It'll reduce the amount of communication. And from this, I, I predict we'll get about another two-fold speed up, right? So we'll get about 1.8x out of the precision uh, and about another 0.2x out of uh, reducing the communication. And then separate from that, in our program we're just starting with Intel, is this idea of uh, uh, AMBA certified desktop solutions. So one of the problems we've had, especially these days, when you, when you actually start putting accelerators into boxes is, you know, you can't, most people can't just go to Amazon and build one for their grad student. Uh, so we wanted to put together a, a proce process by, by which you could go and get a quote from a machine that had the optimum CPU spec and, G and GPU or Xeon Phi spec, right? You can pick all of these. Uh, and you can have it shipped as either a development box at an entry-level workstation. It will come pre-installed with all the software. Uh, you can go to mid-level. Uh, or you can go to the high end, which is actually a, work slash, a workhorse uh, machine. And then we've exp we're expanding that right now to the full life sciences suite. We're talking to uh, various developers of different uh, software packages. And uh, through, this is all through a company called Exact, which I've been working through for many years. Uh, and they, they now have enough experience here to understand how, you know, how these codes perform at different uh, hardware specs. So people can go to them. And I'm fairly confident that what you get from them is a, is a well-balanced machine for the price you've got, right? Uh, because the number of times we have people buying systems and then coming back to us and saying, well, I bought this and the performance is terrible. Uh, so this is something we're going to have jointly launched with Intel shortly uh, that shows this. And I'm talking to the, to the various people for different things. The idea being, you know, if you have a grad student working on, on MD research or computational biology research, they can just, you can buy them a pre-installed system with all of the software in the field with guaranteed performance levels and so on. Uh, and then just to end with a video, uh, because it's always good to look at these things, I've taken away the water here to show it, but this is just a, an MD simulation that I think looks cool. So this is a polymer, linear polymer that people were making for organic solar cells. And when they actually did some uh, tunneling microscopy of this, they found little circles on there on their surface instead of the actual chains, right? And the question comes, you know, they, from, from the experimentalist, it was like, well, we made these linear chains. We expected them to lie down in a straight line on the surface, and yet we got all these circles, what's going on? So we just tried this, and this is running uh, right now on a, on a, this was run on a CPU with a Xeon Phi in there. And we start with a linear chain, and basically at some point, it touches and untouches, touches it, and when it just happens to make this perfect loop, so it touches at just the right residue. The thing just sit, sits there and spins around and completely self-winds. And then once it gets to this point, then it ends up sticking to the surface, right? And we just thought, uh, th this doesn't tell us too much about the mechanism here, but I thought it just looks cool. Uh, and then so our conclusions and our long-term vision here, uh, essentially our partnership with Intel has been very productive to, of late. Uh, uh, there's an engineer called uh, Ashraf Buyan at uh, Intel who's been working uh, very closely with us. Uh, that's, been, that's been very, very helpful. Uh, right now, the latest offload code, and we're going to release version 3 very shortly, but the current publicly available offload code gives, it gives you about 2x performance over our baseline. And then in terms of our long-term vision, we want Xeon Xeon 5 performance to be competitive what we have with GPUs right now, uh, so we can use both types of machines. We want to be able to scale large node counts, and we've got different approaches to this. And then the real key is just keeping the, the code optimized, but also maintainable, which is something we haven't been able to do with the GPU versions we've done, but it's much simpler to do with Xeon Phi. So. And then thank you all for listening. So.